So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mike Frey, um, who is coming to us from uh, USC's Department of Chemistry. She, she's been there since 2013. She started her academic career at the University of New Delhi, getting her BS in 96. And then she uh, got her PhD from uh, UNC Chapel Hill in 2005. She stayed uh, in, the, in the Raleigh area and was at uh, Duke as a postdoctoral researcher for, uh, for a few years. And then she started uh, at uh, USC. And she was kind enough to come down and spend the day with us. And uh, she's going to talk to us about her research and then about the, U the program at USC. Thank you so much, Brian. I was going to say, all you need for a talk is cookies. You don't need the introduction. My name's up there, the title's up there, the cookie defines the fact that it's a seminar. So, well, I want to say that it's been a fantastic day. I really didn't know quite what to expect. I haven't been down to the Myrtle Beach, I guess, since several years ago, and I went straight to the beach and went back. So I was amazed when I saw the camp. I was like, wow, there's a whole other world going on over here. So it's been really nice. You guys have great professors. I hope you're making use of that. Um, and it's great to hear that you have a growing program and uh, hopefully we'll see some of you at USC in the upcoming years. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what my lab does. Uh, I am in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and within that department we actually have many different divisions and I'm in the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology division. So I'm technically the most bio-ish person in that department. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about my research and then the second part I'll tell you guys about our program. Uh, what kind of different divisions are there, what a graduate program there would look like, and uh, places and people that you can contact for additional information. So, um, obviously we are in Colombia. You guys, hopefully some of you have been up there. It's the capital city of our great state. If you guys are politically inclined, there are frequent rallies that you could participate in. Uh, we have a beautiful campus, although after coming here I said, well, I don't know if I want to say that much, but we have a nice campus, which is... Um, there are some old buildings and some historic buildings, but it's quite nice and big and it's bang in the city, so students get to experience both city life and being on campus also. Uh, this is our department. This is kind of a black and white picture. I don't know why it looks black and white here. It's a pink color building. We're right on main campus, uh, which is really nice. We're between biology, pharmacy, uh, public health, so we get to interact with people from different uh, departments, which is great for the graduate students as well. Uh, and apparently there is a nightlife. <laughs> so this is a view from across the bridge of the downtown, so there's things to do there as well. We have some water, not as much water as you guys might have access to, but there's rivers. <laughs> there's a lot of water activities, kayaking, canoeing, all that kind of thing. So for those of you who are worried that you're going to miss water bodies, you're not going to in Colombia. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, our city. Not much more to say besides that, but it's a great place to live as well. So, um, like I said, within our department, there are five areas, which I will come back to at the end of my talk. But there's the Biochemistry Molecular Biology Division, which is what I am in. We're about five or six, six faculty in there. And then there are all the other chemistry divisions, if that's your interest, which is more hard chemistry than <coughs> all the other divisions as well. I'm, of course, in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work, and I want to introduce you guys to this amazing picture, what I think is an amazing picture. You don't have to have a degree in the life sciences to, to appreciate that uh, we all start out like a ball of cells, or some number of cells, and there is a series of uh, amazing events that take you from this ball of cells to this homeostatic, differentiated organism, which is going to turn into one of us at some point, uh, or a normal homeostatic condition. And believe it or not, uh, while this is a fairly complex process that maybe a developmental biologist can talk to you in depth about, I can tell you that there are a handful of molecules or proteins that drive this process. And these are called growth factors. And I have here, because I'm in a chemistry department, I always have to have a periodic table. So this is a periodic table of growth factors, um, very scientifically organized by R&D systems which uh, points to the different factors that play roles in this process of going from a ball of cells to a differentiated embryo. Okay. Um, <coughs> of particular interest to my lab are the set of growth factors on this side of that table. The yellow group over here belongs to a family of growth factors called the transforming growth factor beta. There's a large family of them. They all have similar structures, hence they're called a family. Uh, and the one right next to it, which is called the Wnt family of growth factors, both of these 
play key roles in this process. Uh, however, what has been appreciated in the past decade is that while they're required for this normal sort of behavior that's uh, involved in early development, uh, disease situations, or particularly diseases like cancer, will hijack these pathways. Uh, you can either use them, they use them to their benefit <coughs> for bad outcomes, or you have alterations in the pathways themselves and these growth factors that drive a disease scenario. So there's been a lot of interest in trying to go back to understand these developmental pathways, to understand how can we improve our ability to target these diseases that are driven by these growth factors. And that's kind of what my lab is focused on. So uh, a little bit of a history about this growth factor, transforming growth factor beta. Like I said, it's involved in this normal process. Everything needs to be kept tightly in a certain size and a certain shape. And one of the ways it was discovered was that this is a cow, which hopefully looks abnormal in size to you. This cow has a mutation in one of those TGF beta factors. So you don't have that growth factor anymore, and this cow has kind of got hyper muscles. Um, which tells you that that growth factor is required to keep everything in check. So that's kind of a picture illustrating that. Alternatively, you can take cells. So this is a picture of uh, cells in a dish, and all you have to do is trickle or dribble just a little bit of that growth factor, TGF beta, uh, onto them, and they basically stop growing. So the classical view for the longest time was, this, was that this growth factor plays a key role in keeping cells in check preventing them from hyperproliferating, as evidenced by this animal here and this picture over here. Okay? However, what started emerging was that, the picture that started emerging was that this particular growth factor, TGF beta, is not just involved in keeping things in check, but in diseases like cancer, it does something opposite. It kind of drives the disease. Okay, so what I've drawn, shown over here, is a little uh, tumor, potentially, in any particular organ of the body, it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is a primary tumor, uh, which is still basically a situation which is abnormal, which means the cells are going more. But remember, people don't really die from the primary tumor. So you can have a tumor, you can remove it. People usually die from metastasis, which is when these tumors leave the site and they go to other places. So up in this primary tumor stage, the cells still respond to that growth factor in a way that they're checked by that growth factor. So TGF beta can still su suppress their growth. Something happens, there are some changes that happen. One or 10 or few cells seem to go rogue from that tumor, so to speak, such that now they leave that primary site and they can get out of whatever that tissue they were in and move to other places. And when they start doing that, and we don't know the precise timing of these things just yet, when that happens, the cells start responding differently <coughs> to that growth factor such, such that they're no longer ch in check by TGA beta, but instead this growth factor promotes metastasis. It helps them kind of take advantage of their environment, leave that primary tumor, and then essentially reach other places where they can colonize and essentially make new sites, which are essentially what cause lethality in people. Okay? So the question always has been in the field then, what is it that is contributing to that change that's making these cells respond differently to the growth factor? How are they hijacking the growth factor? Or is the, is the growth factor itself turning the cells on themselves? What are these factors? And so what's emerging again is that it's not just the cells themselves. There's the cells. There might be some mutations that happen in a few cells that changes the response. Or it could also be the surrounding environment. So what is that surrounding environment? Something in the environment that the tumor is in is changing how the cells respond to the growth factors. So maybe you guys have seen it in classes, in cell biology classes, but uh, you have encount hopefully encountered uh, what the extracellular matrix is. This is essentially the, the, the part of your tissue and organ that's keeping the cells uh, attached or together. That's the extracellular matrix, which contains uh, things like fibronectin. It contains collagen and proteoglycans. This extracellular matrix has been known to expand. So if you think about how is, um, if you think about how primary tumors are diagnosed, even in breast cancer, they say the tumors are rigid, right? They're diagnosed by the rigidity. And all that rigidity has to do is with this expanding extracellular matrix. So people were interested in asking whether that extracellular matrix somehow contributes to the fact that that primary tumor is now responding differently to the growth factors themselves. So usually you have your cells over here that are sitting normally, there's one cell, something has changed in that cell, such that now it is responding differently as a result of that ECM. It's contributing to this buildup 
or the buildup is causing the change. We still don't know. It's a bit of a chicken and egg question. But either way, these two processes are linked where you're building up that extracellular matrix. And then eventually, that is triggering an event resulting in the cells leaving that primary tumor, going through your blood vessels, intravasating and extravasating, and then reaching the distant sites where you're going to get metastasis. So this model or this idea that the extracellular matrix is involved is definitely something that people have accepted. So there's ways, we're trying to figure out ways that you can potentially perturb this extracellular matrix as a way to change maybe how the cells respond. These are people, not just me, but there are other people who are interested in that. We're also interested in trying to figure out how you can do that. So um, given what I just told you, this presents a huge challenge in trying to treat a disease with against a particular growth factor if it has multiple functions, right? So for example, if you look at a normal situation, what I told you initially was that TGF-beta is going to suppress the growth of the cells, and as the disease progresses, it starts promoting metastasis. So if TGF-beta is a really good target, and believe me, there are companies that have uh, compounds that target the TGF-beta pathway which have failed miserably in clinical trials because of the fact that this growth factor can have dichotomous functions. So it can do different things in a different context. So without understanding the context under which targeting these pathways is going to be beneficial, that particular compound or that drug is not going to be successful. And that's really what's been borne out in clinical trials with um, uh, drugs targeting the TGF beta pathway. So that remains a challenge, and our, we're hoping that our work will help uh, contribute to the understanding of the contexts under which the TGF beta is a tumor promoter and the context under which TGF beta is a tumor suppressor, so that we can define the specific context where you can just block it so that now you don't get those side effects anymore. So, this is obviously ongoing work from many labs as well. So, this remains the challenge that we're trying to um, work with. Uh, why is it important to block this pathway? I mean, I showed you a periodic table <coughs> with many different in there. Uh, both TGF beta and WINT, which are next to each other in that peri periodic table, uh, they remain an interest as a therapeutic target because they can affect many aspects of cancer biology. So this is a little chart from a review which was published many years ago uh, illustrating the different behaviors that cancer cells have. It's called the hallmarks of cancer with the idea that you can present and say cancer cells exhibit certain behaviors, which we now refer to them as the hallmarks of cancer cell behavior, uh, which is different from normal cell behavior. They can evade death signals, so your normal cells might you know, be in an environment where they receive a signal that says you're in a bad environment, you should die. Cancer cells have uh, developed a way to evade that signal, so they evade apoptosis. Uh, they can uh, have blood supply, they can trigger blood supply so that they supply um, oxygen to themselves, which normally you wouldn't have, so they can sustain blood vessel supply um, under conditions where you normally wouldn't be able to do that, such as changes in oxygen tension. Um, they can also invade tissues and organs, which again, normal cells don't do that. They kind of stay static in one place. But these cancer cells have acquired the ability to invade and then again, metastasize to different places. So there are many, uh, many uh, hallmarks. There's a few new ones keep getting added every now and then. And these growth factors, TG of beta and WINT, which were key in development, right, right next to each other during the periodic table, affect many of these uh, cancer cell behaviors. So again, there's an intense interest in trying to understand how they work and what aspect of how they're working in these uh, cancer cells. So uh, my research program is kind of, um, as I was going through it, I was thinking there's a lot going on in here, uh, is centered around uh, understanding how cancer cells integrate all these different cues. So I talked to you a little bit about growth factor cues. So the cells are receiving these growth factor signals. There's the extracellular matrix around, so the cells have to be able to sense that. Um, and what does it mean that when I say they're responding to it? What that means is the cells can change their genetic program and say, okay, I have more collagen around me, so I need to upregulate something that's going to degrade the collagen. Or I have more TGF beta, so let me start upregulating my receptors that can respond to TGF beta. So cancer cells have the ability to change their program based on their environment. And the question is, how do they do that? Because they're receiving multiple cues, whether it is a change in the extracellular matrix, which is going to result in some kind of change in the tension that the cells might sense, change in the availability of growth factors. So you can have growth factors increased around them. How do they respond to that? Uh, there's lots of other things. I've put an anchorage independent survival here, which is a separate area. 
But we're interested in trying to understand how does this cancer cell integrate all these different signals that can result in their ability to then uh, metastasize and then cause all the problems that um, result in, in death. Uh, um, of course, I just said that, they're all going to affect metastasis. So um, this is a little bit about my group because as I was telling you guys at lunch, I actually do very little experiments lately, which is kind of a shame. The first year I was doing a lot, and then off, off late, I've kind of, I don't know, it's just, I think I have amazing people, so I don't need to do that much work anymore um, on the bench. Uh, these are the three graduate students in my lab. Um, Laura Jenkins came from Clemson University. Ben Horst is the newest member. He is from Furman, uh, and she is from Athens, originally from China, but she had a master's from Athens. And I put them based on the projects that they're working on. Um, they, Laura uh, right now has a graduate fellowship from the NIH to support her work. Ben Horst has an application also pending. So the idea is that these graduate students will build their own research to get their own funding to support themselves. So that would be ideal so that then they can build on that when they go on to their future careers as well. Uh, I also have um, now just one postdoctoral fellow. I had two postdoctoral fellows. One who's gone on to start her own lab, and then uh, Dr. Singh, who works on one aspect over here, who's um, also probably going to be moving on to another position pretty soon, but I have two postdoctoral fellows, which means they got their PhD and then they're continuing their fellowship work. Uh, and then of course, no lab is complete without undergrads. I have a fantastic set of undergraduates right now in my lab. Uh, three of them are already on publications. Um, Sadly, none of them are going to grad school, although we're still trying to work on this one over here. She's a sophomore, so we keep saying, still, there's still time to convince her to stay in research. Um, and then I've had other undergrads go through the lab over other periods of time, but these, these four are there right now, and they're really fantastic. So um, this is sort of some, this, this is the people in my lab currently. Um, and um, today I'm going to tell you about two kind of short stories, yet connected stories, to give you a flavor for what kind of methodologies we use, what kind of things we're learning from the research we're doing. And I'm going to start out with this, uh, uh, with this little project here, which talks about controlling growth factor availability. So remember I said that the cells are exposed to growth factors? Uh, remember they're not exposed to just one growth factor at a time. At any given time there's a whole slew of them and sometimes as scientists we kind of tend to forget that and we just pick this one growth factor and think that that's all the cells are seeing but they're really seeing a multiple of them. So we're really interested in looking at those key molecules that can dictate the availability of multiple members on that periodic table because that will make more sense. They're really going to be seeing all of them at the same time, not just one. So um, this project was spearheaded by one of the graduate students who was interested in looking at these receptors over here, which I call co-receptors. Co-receptors, as the word suggests, are co to receptors, which means they, are, they were thought originally when the name was given as co-receptors, the idea was that these are molecules that present ligands or present growth factors to the classical receptors, which means molecules that have uh, the ability to phosphorylate things, so kinases. So these are the classical receptors, and core receptors by definition, textbook definition of it is it's something that can present the ligand to a receptor. So obviously presentation of ligand is important because if the receptor doesn't see the ligand, it doesn't know that it has to do whatever job it does, whether it's phosphorylation or dephosphorylation as the case might be. So uh, this is kind of another diagram of that, um, sort of alternative view of this. Here is your plasma membrane. There's external matrix components like fibrinectin collagen. And then embedded in that ECM are these core receptors, which somehow can connect both with growth factors, because they serve as sort of ways to present the ligand to the receptors. And then they also talk to the cells indirectly through the ECM. So one such core receptor that we're uh, intensely interested in is this receptor called beta glycan. Another name for it is the T, it's called TGF beta R3, or it's called the type, it was discovered originally as a TGF beta co-receptor, hence it was called TGF beta R3. It's also called beta glycan. Usually, if you have a glycan type name, that means that you have glycan chains on it, and that's what that is. It is a molecule which can serve as a co-receptor and has sugar chains attached to it. And um, a common theme in all these signaling pathways, no matter what signaling pathway you take, is that usually you will have a molecule that can present this growth factor to a serine or some kind of kinase, serine kinase or tyrosine kinase, 
So the purple over here is TGA beta, which is being presented by this yellow box, very non-biochemical uh, structure of, of beta-glycan. And then when the receptors receive the signal, they're going to initiate a signaling cascade inside the cell. I'm not going to bore you with that uh, intracellular cascade at the moment because it's not relevant for the talk. But we were really interested in this particular beta-glycan over here because of the fact that it has these sugar chains and could potentially serve as a reservoir for other receptors as well. This is what some of these sugar chains look like. So the interesting thing about that is that the cell doesn't just make one form of the receptor. It can have the purple over here with that is the receptor. It can have either heparin sulfate type sugar chains. It can also have chondroitin sulfate type chains. So based on the kind of chain you can imagine, if any of you are chemists, you know you're changing the charge distribution on that receptor. So this is a receptor on the cell surface which has both kinds of chains attached on it. You can also have a pool of a pool of a part of the cell or pool of cells which might have only one of the chains. So you can have only heparin sulfate chains attached, or you could have only chondroitin sulfate chains attached, or you could have a form of the receptor which doesn't have any sugar chains attached. And this happens in cells. You can take different cell types and you do a distribution, and basically you can see a distribution of one form or the other. So Laura then was really interested in asking, well. Given that um, this receptor was already known to bind or interact with the TGA beta members because it has all these sugar chains, what about the other growth factors on this table that are glycoproteins and have high affinity for these types of sugar chains? And from a literature search, what she found was that the wind family of glycoproteins, which is right next to that, has a really high tendency to aggregate or bind to these sugar chains. So she wanted to ask, well, does this receptor, which as far as we knew, had no role in presenting uh, this growth factor to the cells, would the change on this receptor make any difference to the availability of Wnt to the cancer cells themselves? So she systematically did a whole lot of experiments to test what happens when you put the receptor back in cells, you make the modifications on the chains, and how does that affect Wnt signaling? So I was trying to avoid the word signaling. Sometimes people kind of go into a daze as soon as you use the word signaling. We're not going to talk too much about that, but I want to just highlight to you that there are many ways to, to uh, look at the readout of signaling. You can do, uh, use antibodies that are specific to uh, phosphoepitopes on proteins. You can look at activation of genes in response to that growth factor. So this growth factor Wnt, for example, when it activates its signaling cascade, inside the cells it will activate a set of genes that you can read out in a luciferase type of assay. So that's kind of what's shown over here. This is the cells without the wind. You add the wind and they respond to it. So her question was, if I put back my receptor, what's going to happen to that wind signal in those cells? And what she found was that there was a striking suppression of that wind induction, wind signal induction when she put, those, put that receptor in. Her idea was that this has to do with the sugar chains, so she went about putting in the receptor in multiple forms, either with just one form of the chain, which is just a chondroitin sulfate, or just the heparin sulfate, or she put a scenario where she took out both the chains to see what happens. So this is just one experiment to show you that she used a system where you would only get the receptor with just the chondroitin sulfate chains. And when she did that, she kind of got the opposite of what she saw over here. Oops, sorry I went too far back. When she put the full receptor with both the chains in, it kind of reduced the signaling. When she has only the chondroitin sulfate chains and it doesn't do the reduction, it does kind of the opposite. So basically just by changing the sugar chains, you're changing the availability of the growth factor to the cells. And that's kind of the readout that you're getting with this luciferase assay. She confirmed that with different ways. She also put a heparin sulfate modification in. I'm not showing you guys the data. But basically, she found that if you have a heparin sulfate chain, you block the availability of the receptor, of the growth factor for the cells. If you have the chondroitin sulfate chains, you increase the availability. So this tells you that the proteoglycans, just based on the kind of chains you might have, is going to change the availability of Wnt for its signaling. Of course, we can't ignore the fact that uh, this receptor also binds TGA beta down here. So she is now working on trying to figure out how it's going to impact the availability of TGA beta to the cells, because we know that the sugar chains are impacted by wind, what happens to TGA beta at that time, and that's the work that she's continuing as part of her um, graduate thesis. 
So um, that was her work over here, and that's kind of this end on this diagram where I was trying to illustrate to you guys that controlling the availability of the ligand to the cells is going to be a key aspect in how the cells are going to respond. And one of those core receptors that I mentioned to you is T beta R3 or beta glycan, which we think is an important regulator of this growth factor availability. However, uh, what happens in human cancers, and uh, this is only a slide to illustrate a point to you guys, is that this core receptor that I just mentioned, beta glycan, is actually down regulated in most cancers. So this is kind of a chart, and this is again just to illustrate to you guys a chart of uh, patient samples, different types of tumors. For every tumor, there's two lanes. On the left-hand side of each is a normal uh, tissue from that patient, and then right next to it is their matched kind of disease situation. So all I want you guys to take home from this is that for all, most of these organs, the left side has more expression as opposed to the right side. What this was telling us is that these cancer cells downregulate that core receptor that I was talking about, which controls the availability of that growth factor. And not only do they downregulate it, you can also see that in patients that have higher expression of that core receptor, they actually do better in terms of their survival. So we take our findings from the lab and we try to see what happens in patients, and it turns out they do need that core receptor because if they don't, the patients actually do worse. And this is hold, held true in other uh, tumors as well. So essentially what I'm saying is I told you guys over here that beta glycan plays a key role in controlling the availability of growth factors, but I'm also telling you that it's gone most of the time in tumor cells. So what happens when this is gone? The cells are going to keep putting out these growth factors. You don't have that rheostat anymore, so what's going to happen? So we decided to take a systematic approach to say, when you don't have that core receptor in these cancer cells, what kind of growth factors are being produced at large amounts, and what is the consequence of that large amount of growth factor that's secreted, and why is that good, is that bad, and what is that telling us? So we went through this, growth, this whole table over here, actually we didn't look at the left side, but we went through this entire right side and said, let's look at patients and see which growth factor they're producing in the highest amount. Turns out, one of them is a particular uh, member of this TGA beta family called inhibin. I was talking to you about inhibin earlier, it's also a hormone. And very little is known about inhibin, although people have noted that inhibin is a biomarker for certain cancers, so a lot of patients make a lot of this hormone and it's used as a biomarker, but they don't know what it does. We had a little bit of a suspicion that this could be bad because the rheostat that controls its availability is gone, but the cells are putting out lots of this inhibin. So what is this inhibin doing in the absence of its rheostat on that epithelial cell? Okay. So we went in and confirmed this in patients. Uh, so the, for example, this is a picture from a slide which has spotted on it 50 different or maybe this one has 75 different cores of patients. So tumors from patients were sliced and they make a little spot on it on the slide. And any of you done any immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry or anything like that here? Have you read about it? So yes, so you can do that on slides where you can take your slide and put a primary antibody on it and a secondary antibody to detect and look for expression of different proteins. So we wanted to look for expression of this inhibin that we found that was really produced in high amounts. And we basically confirmed what's already in the literature, it's always good to do that, uh, that uh, compared to a lot of the normals, the tumors basically made a large amount. The brown is the indication that that protein is made. We saw higher expression of the protein itself. We also checked in patients in, in their uh, bodily fluids, and they were basically the normal individuals had very low, and actually the people, or the women, who had, this is from ovarian cancer patients, I probably didn't mention that, and these women who have um, stage three, four ovarian cancer put out a lot, large amount of that growth factor as compared to uh, normal people. So that confirmed our findings, but we still didn't know what it was doing. So after a lot of um, sort of breaking our heads against the wall, trying to figure out what it does, 
Remember I told you the rheostat is not present. The receptor for this growth factor is no longer present on the cancer cells itself. So we had to kind of hypothesize that it cannot be having an effect on the cancer cells themselves because they don't have the receptor. So it must be having an effect on neighboring cells. So we tested that, hy that hypothesis by taking cancer cells that make a lot of this growth factor and literally dumping it on endothelial cells. So what are endothelial cells? You guys know what endothelial cells are? These are cells. Skin. 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 Yes. Endothelial. Do you know what the vasculature is? Your blood vessels? Your, so the endothelial cells basically line your blood vessels. So as opposed to epithelials that line your um, body, the organs. So, and the tumor that's growing inside these organs has all these. It has your epithelial cells. It has the endothelial cells, which are going to provide blood supply to the uh, tumors themselves. So they kind of have a mixture of that. So since we knew that the tumor cells are producing this growth factor, we wanted to ask, is it having an effect on the other cell types, which was the endothelial cells? Does that make sense? So we tested that. This is kind of what's shown over here, is a little tumor in green. And as it receives more and more blood supply, these tumors grow. So many of these tumors actually need blood supply to grow. So we re recapitulated this kind of an assay in a, in a dish. So you can take um, basement membrane, you can put endothelial cells there, and allow them to differentiate, so to speak, or form these branches, which is indicative of their ability to form tubes. So when we take, do that, you can see that the cells that are making that growth factor form these tube-like structures, but the cells that don't really make that growth factor, and this we had artificially reduced the growth factor in those cells, they are less capable of forming those uh, tubes. So this kind of told us that now this growth factor is actually having what's called a paracrine effect, or an effect on a neighboring cell. We can confirm this, which is what we've done, in, in mice. So the mice tend to be a really good model system for studying a lot of these biologies, and particularly for looking at blood vessel formation. What we can do here is we can take whatever we want to test, which is either the what's secreted by the tumor cells, or we can mix the growth factor itself with this basement membrane called matrigel. You just kind of inject it under the skin of mice, and then that particular plug that forms is going to attract blood vessels to actually give you vasculature. It's kind of what it looks like over here. These plugs, if you have no vasculature, or the plugs if you have vasculature. And it turns out that what, that's what happens. You can take the, the tumor cells that are making that growth factor, and they're red because they're getting blood, blood, blood supply into it, or if these tumor cells are not making it, they don't have that blood supply. You can recapitulate that by, by just putting the growth factor and you get the same thing. So this basically confirmed for us the idea that these tumor cells are basically secreting things, particularly in the absence of their receptors, that can have paracrine effects to essentially stimulate angiogenesis, which is going to be important for those cancer cells to then grow and metastasize. Okay? So, um, I'm going to stop here with the research stories, but hopefully I've kind of given you an idea that we're trying to link each one of these here. The first part of the story was how do you connect, how do you control what happens to the growth factors themselves when you don't have the receptors, who is controlling it, and then what happens when you don't have those receptors, what's the effect of these growth factors on the tumor growth and metastasis, and, we're, and our studies are finding that these tumor cells will stimulate angiogenesis in a paracrine way by secreting things that are not now sequestered by their rheostats, which should have been their normal cells. So, uh, of course, our goal is then to test this in metastasis itself, and these studies are ongoing, and we do these in mice, where we can take the tumor cells, inject them into the mice, block this growth factor, and see if it actually blocks metastasis. Because again, like I said, uh, what kills people is actually metastasis, not so much primary tumor growth. So we're interested now in trying to see if targeting this growth factor would be a good anti-metastatic therapeutic strategy. And that's something that's kind of ongoing in the lab. So I'm going to stop with that. Uh, as far as the research go goes, uh, and our long-term goal is to define mechanisms a little bit more about how these growth factors work. Again, identify how they're doing this. I just told you the phenomena. I don't really know the details about how they're inducing the angiogenesis. So we need to figure that out, again, so that we can be more specific about how we block these pathways, so we're not just not blocking all blood 
um, uh, uh, angiogenesis. You don't want to block your normal vasculature. You want to be more specific. And hopefully these studies will serve as a paradigm for other growth factors. We haven't touched the left side of the growth factor chart, and we're going to leave that for somebody else <laughs> to do. So uh, that's kind of our long-term goal in, in my lab. Then. Uh, these, this is my group. Again, I already introduced you guys to many people. This is already outdated. Um, I didn't include my newest graduate student in there, so uh, I should probably change this. But this is from recently. They all do the work. Uh, we work as a team. All the projects, even though there's a lead on a project, usually, you know, if you think you can do these things on your own, you really cannot. Uh, so we always try to team people up, so sort of bring in together, if somebody's good at immunofluorescence, you pair them with somebody who's good at biochemistry, who's somebody who's good at working with mice, and so all the projects tend to be team projects with a single lead, so that you do kind of dictate what's going to happen, but you get the help of everybody else in the lab. Um, we not just work, we also do fun stuff in our lab. Um, again, this is, uh, I don't, last year, every year we do a lab retreat type of thing. Um, we go somewhere, uh, we do, the last 2015 I get, we did some whitewater rafting, um, we did some hiking in different places, so we try to incorporate some fun also. It's not just how, just not just work, we also play a little bit. Uh, and I myself cannot do things on my own. Again, when I started out, I thought, I can do this on my own. I really cannot. I have some amazing collaborators uh, who help out, uh, both on USC campus, and also not at USC, but other places. I've only listed some of them over here, just to again give you a flavor that the students, um, the, the, the PI sometimes joke that a collaboration can only be successful if the students are talking. I can talk endlessly with Brian, but if the students aren't talking to each other, it's never gonna work. So the students themselves lead the collaborations. We're kind of just facilitating all of it. So I think my graduate students are getting a good exposure to different techniques and different people um, with different skills as well. Uh, we also work hard to get money because all the work requires money. The students are actively engaged in applying for funding. Graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, myself, we do this. Um, writing grants can be fun. Mm, it's not always bad because you get to test out your ideas on paper, have people look at it, and uh, if they like the idea, it's probably a good question to pursue. Uh, if they don't like the idea, maybe it's something you need to rethink, and this is not the most appropriate line of investigation. So grants can be fun as well. So um, I'm sure you guys have talked to many of your professors and have so many opportunities. There's so many things you can do with your uh, life science degree. Uh, I just put some of these things over here. Uh, when I started as a grad student, uh, my PhD advisor said, are you going to academics or not? That was it. I said, I guess I am. This is, you know, some time ago. But I think now most of us appreciate there are many paths besides just going into academics with a science degree. Um, of course, you guys are undergraduates. You could get a master's or a PhD, depending on what you're doing. And you can still do all the different things that you wanted, might want to do. Most of these are allied science careers. My husband is in an allied science career. He has a PhD, but he doesn't do bench science. So I think everybody today understands that there are many more avenues for you guys. And a PhD can set you up for any of those avenues. It just doesn't have to be academics alone. So I just kind of wanted to say that because when I was a grad student, I'm sure for many of you, it wasn't like that. If you did a PhD, you're going to teach or you're going to research. It's not like that anymore. So you guys are actually in a good time that you can explore all these different options after a PhD. Uh, as I said, um, this is our department. Oh, a better picture over here. It's called the Graduate Science Research Center. And um, students can actually come into the program through two routes. Uh, you can either apply directly to the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and enter the program that way. The School of Medicine, and I didn't put up slides on that because I'm not representing the School of Medicine today, but the School of Medicine has what's called an Interdisciplinary Biomedical Science Program, which you can apply to. If you get into that program, you essentially do rotations in labs across campus. So there's some advantages to that, um, but again, they don't guarantee. There, there have been situations where students have not got found a lab, and then it's a problem. Uh, occasionally, it, it, it happens rarely, but it has happened, which I would say has never happened in our department. Once you accept the students, it is our responsibility to make sure that you find a lab that you that you know that can support you for your graduate career. So you can enter our program through either of those uh, departments. Our department actually pays among the highest stipends on campus. Uh, it was 24000 last year, and I believe it's going to go up to 24500 this year, so 
even within the same university, you can actually, depending on the department, your stipend can be very different. So I know that ours is definitely on the higher side. The average time to PhD, four and a half years, this is true, uh, although this four and a half is also coming from a lot, the chemistry PhDs can be closer to four, the bio PhDs can be closer to five and a half, so that your average ends up being about four and a half. Um, you know, you do first year, you have classes, courses that you can do, there's a good amount of flexibility in that. People who come to my lab don't always do a lot of the inorganic courses. I'll make them take some classes in bio or pharmacy or something like that. So there's, you know, it's very PI dependent. You work with your mentor to choose the kind of courses you want to do. There's lab duty. So if you guys are interested in, in teaching in the future, then definitely in our program, you have the opportunity to teach also that can set you up for a teaching career, which in some medical school programs, you may not have the opportunity to develop. And then after all that's done, you basically focus on your PhD project. This could involve both doing TAing and researching, or just doing research that just depends on the lab. Um, and then, you know, our program is fairly structured, which I think is a strength in that we have a very set timeline on when the students take their, you know, um, the plan and a proposal, the two steps to the graduate program. We keep that kind of tight to make sure the graduate students stay on track for graduating. So, you know, these are all details that if you're interested in graduate school, you could look into. But I would say it's a fairly a controlled program. What I mean by that is students aren't just kind of you know, hanging around and you know, four years later, what's your project? That doesn't usually happen. So I'd say that's the strength in our department. Again, like I mentioned, these are different areas. Um, within biochemistry and molecular biology, uh, we are the faculty in that division, a uh, fairly diverse group. Um, this is me. Karen Outen is, uh, works on iron and redox homeostasis, and she uses budding yeast as a model. Uh, again, iron is important for every single biochemical reaction in your body, and she's very interested in how iron is taken up and how cells respond, respond to changes in iron. You can think about it as iron signaling in some ways, and she uses budding yeast for that. Uh, Wayne Outen, is, he looks at me metal metabolism. Uh, in E. coli, so he uses bacterial models to study that. Um, he's also in biochemistry. Tom Macris also is studies uses E. coli as a model, but he's interested in understanding uh, ways to develop new uh, antibiotic and antimicrobials, um, and also uh, better ways to get um, fuels, so hydrocarbon biosynthesis, but he's again doing that in um, bacterial systems. Max Krush is actually an X-ray crystallographer par excellence. I mean, he's an amazing X-ray crystallographer. Uh, it's great because uh, for some of the things that we do, and many of us do, we don't know much about structure, but so you can go talk to him. So he's a great collaborator. And then, of course, he has his own lab, which specifically looks at allergens, uh, understanding the structure of allergens, again, as a better way to um, treat allergies that we might have. I'm not going to talk about Jim Sodets because this is a picture from him about 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't find the most recent picture of him. And he says, I don't have a recent picture. Use that one. <laughs> so Jim's actually retiring, so I'm not going to talk about it. So is, uh, John is on, also going to be retiring soon. So um, I don't know how, much, how many more students are going to take. But that's our division. Um, did I miss one? OK. Organic uh, as a separate division. Again, um, in organic, there are people doing different things. John Levine, to me, is kind of a biochemistry, organic type of person. He uh, is interested in um, developing new sensors, particularly for cancer. He has this really cool system that he's developed where you, he has these conjugated polymers uh, that he can put in an array with the idea that people who have diseases have uh, display a different kind of sugar profile. And you can use that to screen for people who have disease or not. They have validated, he has validated some of his arrays in colon cancer, ovarian, and I think he's working on prostate right now. And they're always working to improve that array a little bit better. So his work to me is obviously very fascinating because we do a little bit of sugar work and cancer work. So that's John Levine. Uh, Ken and Linda Shimizu are in organic. Uh, Ken Shimizu works in printed polymers. Uh, and Linda works, again, she's more on the synthesis side, and she's interested in synthesizing and assemb assembling um, Cyclourias, uh, although she keeps saying that she's trying to move more into the bio and organic side, but this is the latest I heard from her. Um, and then there's more in organic. Again, spectrum, there's a whole group that works on polymer chemistry, 
So they're interested in uh, different kinds of polymers um, for a wide range of applications. Both Schwambing and Brian Benzovich work on polymer chemistry. Chin Wang is definitely a little more on the bio side. He does nanomaterial work uh, as a way to improve drug delivery methods. Um, so he's kind of, his research, I mean, I can understand it much better than some of the other uh, uh, people in organic, but he's got this cool system using tobacco mosaic virus where he generates these scaffolds. Um, and so, anyway, so he does a lot of work in different disease aspects, but improving nanomaterials from a material side of things. Cheryl is again a synthetic chemist and she is working on synthetic methodologies. Uh, she and I are, just to give you an idea, she and I have talked about a receptor that we think has uh, is a potential target. It, it has kinase activity. So she has looked at the structure and she said, well, give me a compound that you think works on it and we can synthesize better versions of the inhibitor. Again, this is what a lot of companies are doing these days, you know, taking the same, same drug and trying to kind of change it a little bit and repurpose it. So she's doing that for us for free. So anyway, as a collaboration. So um, again, we work with these different people. Inorganic, a whole set of people inorganic. Um, Natalia Shostova and uh, Dimitri, uh, she works on materials, generating new materials for sustainable energy, and he works on more organometallics and catalysis, uh, both him and Rick Adams, I guess, uh, and he does more solid state uh, chemistry. And then we have physical chemistry. Physical chemists are um, Andrew Graytek and Hugh Wang. Uh, Hugh Wang actually does this cool single mo molecule spectroscopy uh, based methods to study structures and um, single molecule biophysics. So um, he's up there and then Andrew is working on developing uh, nanostructure based semiconductors uh, in the lab. So um, that's Andrew. And then the last division is analytical and environmental. So as you can see, there's a lot of divisions doing a lot of different things. Um, and, and in this division, again, spans the spectrum of looking at, you know, what's going on in your drinking water? Can we have a better way to analyze that? And all the way to uh, John Ferry, who's doing environmental chemistry and forensic analysis. Steve Morgan has some cool work on developing ways of picking up things that might be um, used for forensics. So if there's fibers left on, you know, crime scenes and things like that. So he has a cool tool. Uh, developed a new methodologies to uh, you know study that. So um, that's as far as the analytical. So that's our entire department. Fairly covers the age spectrum. Fairly dynamic group, and we're actually a fun department to work with. I've enjoyed my stay there. So that brings me to the end. Um, if you guys have any questions or interested in learning more, here's my website and here's my contact information. Feel free to contact me. Uh, I can always put you in touch with whoever else you might be interested in talking to um, if I don't have the answer to your questions. So, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Any questions? Could you explain the anatomy of a growth factor? Ah, so when you say anatomy of growth factor, what do you mean? Uh, is it like a protein? Yes, enzyme? yes, so these are proteins, the small uh, protein molecules, so anywhere from 25 to 50 kilodalton in size, so they're pretty small. And they are synthesized by the cells, they get secreted out, and depending on the growth factor, they can either be secreted out in an inactive con conformation and they require some activation, uh, and most of them work as dimer dimeric forms, um, and then they are basically recognized cell surface receptors. So, but they are proteins, yes. When you mentioned the clinical trials for a tumor growth factor, mm -hmm. does that got to do with tissue specificity, or are we talking about secondary factors that are leading to different functionalities? So, as far as I know, with the TGF beta drugs, there are a lot of cardiac side effects, and that's because TGF beta has key functions in um, basically maintaining normal cardiac function. And presumably that was why it was not, not an off-target effect. It's basically because it's having an effect on other tissue where it shouldn't really be blocking that pathway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is it's kind of a general question, and it's something I've been curious about. When you were showing those pictures of the, of the gel mm -hmm. where the blood vessels have been yep. invaded, what kind of um, patterning 
do the do those vessels take, or even there? Yeah. Because there's um, like, uh, are you familiar with intussusception, intussusceptive angiogenesis, where the, where, the, where like one one uh, capillary will split, a pillar forms between. Ah, them, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to sprouting. Yep. So. Oh yeah, versus sprouting. Yeah, yeah. So we we haven't looked at sprouting. Yeah. So intussusception yeah. is like is ends up being one of the most common, mm -hmm. apparently common forms of angiogenesis mm -hmm. in in animals because it's I guess more efficient. You can Correct. split and spread yep. faster. What do you see in your in, in, in your in your cell lines mm -hmm. as well as the, the, the gel implants. Right. And it also always got me to think, well you know when I look at, at vascular casts of, of uh, uh, tumor vasculature, it seems like there's a lot more sprouting going yep. on. Absolutely. And so, not so much of the intussusception. Yep. So our as this particular assay is not set up to, it's not a true sprouting assay, so we won't be able to measure <coughs> sprouting in here. What we do know is that the cell growth is not different, so it's not like the cells are proliferating faster. They're definitely producing more branches, but whether it's because of sprouting or not, we don't know that yet. So we haven't tested sprouting, and there are ways to do that, and we probably will do that. And is it, does anybody know, again, in general, but does, does anybody uh, determine what growth factors or, or signals determine whether a sprout forms or whether the split. There's, yeah, so there's definitely a, um, a lot of literature on pathways that are specifically involved in sprouting, uh, tip stock formation, uh, things like that. So there are pathways like notch and DLL that are involved in the tip formation that then eventually leads to sprouting. So yes, there's definitely uh, a lot of literature on that. Um, it's known what pathways contribute to it. Very likely we're, we are activating some of this because again, inhibin is a growth factor. Uh, so we know, and I didn't get have time to talk about, we know that it certainly seems to activate certain metalloproteases that helps in degrading some of this matrigel that these cells are growing in. And again, these matrix metalloproteases are used by cells to branch out. So very likely one of the known pathways is involved. Uh, I would be surprised if we discovered a whole new pathway involved in angiogenesis. I don't think that. I do think this is a new signal for angiogenesis, but I don't, it's probably using one of the pathways that's already known. Mm -hmm. But from our standpoint, we're more interested in trying to figure out just that signal reception level. And then secondly, is this, is going to be, is blocking this growth factor going to be a good way to reduce angiogenesis mm -hmm. uh, in general? Because some of, one of the problems, again, as I was mentioning earlier, with the anti, current anti-VEGF therapies in patients is the same issue as with TGA beta, which is that they have severe toxicities and patients have all kinds of perforation problems and things like that. And inhibin particularly is in, in a certain age of patients, particularly postmenopausal women, as I was telling you earlier, they don't have any physiological function. It's not, postmenopausal women don't make inhibin. So if you don't have a physiological function, then potentially this would be a tumor-specific target, is what we're, you know, this is our kind of nirvana yeah. idea. But it's bearing out to some extent, at least both in the patients and some of the biology that we're seeing. And we've, we've gotten an antibody that blocks angiogenesis, and we're hoping to see if that can be used as a potential therapeutic strategy. So. I don't know, I don't went circuit to that on your question. But no, that's, yeah. that's all yeah. wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Do you have anything else? Let's think about that. All right. Thank you.